Our next speaker is also from IMSC. I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing Manjari Bakchi, who will speak to us about studying gravitational physics through pulsars. Thank Anjali. you. Good afternoon. So I feel privileged to be here today and tell you about pulsars, which are best laboratories to study gravitational physics and that laboratory nature has made for us. We did not need to uh, make any laboratory. So what are pulsars? Pulsars are a kind of dead stars called neutron stars. What are neutron stars? When a star say moderately massive, uh, say like 10 times heavier than the sun, when it dies, what happens? So here first let me tell you what is death of a star. So when a star is alive like our sun, we know that there is nuclear fusion inside it and because of that nuclear fusion it generates uh, heat and uh, that heat and electromagnetic waves means that energy is being emitted. That is how we uh, receive heat and uh, light or uh, electromagnetic waves. But then after burning nuclear uh, energy for lo long time, all the nuclear fuels one day uh, uh, will be exhausted. When that happens, that time there is no more energy generation. But the star keeps on uh, emitting energy. So it starts to cool down. And when it was hot because of uh, high temperature, there was a large gas pressure. We know from our class 10 physics, PV equal to NKT, right? If high temperature, you have high gas, gas pressure and that gas pressure balance gravitational uh, pull inwards. So we get a stable alive star. But when the star is cold, means after its death, when there is no more generation of energy, but it is emitting energy. So it is cold and gravity uh, is as usual because there is no loss of uh, mass. So the star uh, starts to collapse. And that time, uh, so if the star is moderately massive, okay, this collapse happens through a explosive event known as supernova explosion. And most of the matter of the star, especially the outside matter, it get expelled uh, in the uh, interstellar medium. And the inner part, it collapses. And when it collapses due to extreme gravity, atomic structure breaks. There is no more atoms. So we first get uh, free electrons and free nuclei. Then if the gravity is even stronger, then even nuclear structure breaks. We get free protons, free neutrons, and free electrons. And we know protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. So they attract each other and protons become neutrons. So we get a free soup of uh, neutron gas. And we, this time, due to quantum mechanical pressure, we, uh, due to Paulus exclusion principle, what we call degeneracy pre, uh, pressure, that pressure can balance further gravitational collapse. And if this neutron degeneracy pressure can balance the gravitational collapse, we get a stable stellar system. That is what we call neutron star. And as it is a result of gravitational collapse, and you uh, say the atoms are bigger, now we have only tiny neutrons. Uh, so they are extremely dense, means so dense that some uh, say you have a neutron star of mass as large as our sun or maybe heavier than sun, maybe uh, twice uh, the mass of the sun, its radius is only 10 kilometer. So, uh, so we sometimes say as, as analogy that if you can take one teaspoon of nuclear, uh, neutron star matter, it will be as heavy as Mount Everest. So because of this, uh, this extreme density, the gravitational field around a neutron star is extremely strong. So strong that you cannot explain all the gravitational phenomena around it using your Newtonian classical mechanics. You need to use Einstein's general theory of relativity. That is why neutron stars are such great laboratory to study various applications or uh, theoretical predictions of general relativity. So some people actually even tried to use neutron stars to test alternative theories of gravity. And this extreme density is one interesting point of neutron star. 
but that is not the last point. They are also extremely, extremely strong magnets. So they are magnetic field, uh, you can localize in the range of 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 15 Gauss. So I'm sorry, we astronomers are still not in SI units. We are in CGS units. So uh, all my units will be Gauss. I will, uh, I'm not going to Tesla. So as the neutron stars have magnetic fields in 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 15 Gauss. And to give a comparison that freeze magnets we all use, those are around 50 or 60 Gauss. So you can uh, understand how strong those magnetic fields are. There is another thing, these neutron stars are extremely fast rotator. Like everything means like our earth rotates around its own axis and it takes one day, right? That is the definition to rotate around its own axis. So all the stars also rotates around their own axis. Like the sun takes 26 days to rotate around, means 26 Earth's day to rotate around its own axis. And the neutron stars can take uh, maybe a few milliseconds to uh, up to at most uh, 10 seconds to uh, make a complete rotation around their own axis. So you imagine you have a star uh, of say heavier than the sun, it is uh, completing one full spin within one millisecond. So that is also a very interesting point because that also has some implication in gra gravity study because when you have a rotating object, the, that also affects uh, space-time curvature around it. But uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, we call frame dragging effect today. So we call this uh, a spin period. Spin period uh, of neutron star lies in the range of at a millisecond to uh, uh, 10 second. Now, uh, as we know, the like, uh, sun or other stars, they uh, emit uh, like sunlight uh, we see, but that is not the only uh, like, uh, electromagnetic energy sun is emitting, right? Uh, the sun emits from very high frequency gamma rays to very low frequency uh, uh, radio. Similarly, all other stars and our dead neutron stars also emit throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, starting from uh, the very high frequency gamma rays to very low frequency radio waves. But there is one interesting aspect, means our atmosphere blocks most part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, electromagnetic waves coming from outer space. Only a small window of the optical spectrum and a large window of the radio spectrum, those part can come to the earth. So that has one advantage. If you want to detect uh, optical signal or radio signal from a star, you can have your detector on ground. But you, if you want to uh, detect gamma ray or X-ray, you have to place your detector uh, on a satellite and put it top of the atmosphere. So that has the disadvantage because when you want to put, place your detector on a satellite, you cannot make it as big as uh, possible because a satellite cannot carry a very big uh, instrument. But when you are making uh, something on ground, you can make it as big as possible. Uh, so like the, there uh, is on international effort, 30 meter optical tele telescope. We have uh, it's a very big radio telescopes, 300 meter diameter or in China 500 meter diameter. So that is why because you can make radio telescopes very big, it's a studying uh, stars in radio wavelengths, you, uh, those are very, gives very precise result. But here you will ask, okay, we understand that uh, all other stars, including neutron stars, they emit throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. But why do they emit at all? Because I said that neutron stars are dead star. Means first they stop their nuclear fusion, then they collapse, then we got. But yes, uh, but today they are dead. But once upon their lifetime, they were alive. That time there was nuclear fusion. Like, uh, there was heat. So they are still hot. So they keep on emitting that residual heat. That is one part. Second reason is, uh, as I said, they are very strong magnets. So there are high energy uh, particle physics phenomena like uh, brain star lung effect, synchrotron radiation, inverse compton mechanism. So because of that, they uh, emit electromagnetic wave. Then comes 
uh, one phenomenon uh, is called accretion. If a neutron star is gravitationally bound to a giant star, then due to extreme gravity, the neutron star can pull matter from its giant companion. And when that matter falls onto the surface of the neutron star, uh, there is very strong uh, X-ray beam. And we know that X-ray, even in our lab, X-ray is generated in that uh, same principle, right? You heat a metal uh, surface or some uh, object through very high energy particle, then you get X-ray beam. It is a kind of uh, similar thing. And that X-ray beam you can detect by placing your X-ray detector on a satellite. And India's AstroSat satellite is doing that very good. But I am not interested in all this type of study of neutron stars. What I study that is a pulsar mechanism. So I said ne uh, neutron stars are very strong magnet. And for Earth, like, like we, you know, that Earth's spin axis and magnetic axis are misaligned, right? Geographical North Pole and magnetic North Pole are different. So that is possible for any stars, uh, including neutron stars, that their spin axis, means axis of rotation and magnetic axis are misaligned. And if that happens, then when the neutron star rotates, the spin uh, magnetic axis also rotates around the spin axis. And it is the basic principle of classical electromagnetics uh, that if you have a rotating magnet, there will be strong electromagnetic beam uh, will be emitted from two over poles. So that is why when you have a neutron star, there is strong beamed electromagnetic emission from its uh, along uh, two poles along its magnetic axis. So now you have a electromagnetic beam. And when the neutron star is rotating, as the magnetic axis is also rotating. So this electromagnetic beam is also rotating. So now it can happen that say this speaker is if earth and the electromagnetic beam is rotating. After one rotation, if it falls onto the earth and if our detector is on, we can see it. But uh, it is continuously rotating, right? So it will fall onto earth momentarily, it will move on. Then after one rotation, it will fall on earth again it will then move out again. After on another rotation, it will fall onto earth again. So from us, we cannot see anything else. Uh, uh, we are seeing only when the, the signal is falling onto. So for us, it, uh, we might, may, might think that something is pulsing. So that is why the name uh, pulsar came, but it is a wrong name. It is actually, a, we can call it is not a pulsating, but we call it pulsar, it is actually a rotator. So first pulsar was discovered in 1967 uh, by Jocelyn Bell. And as in the morning, Professor Rohini mentioned that Vera Rubin did not get a Nobel Prize. Here also it is unfortunate. Uh, Jocelyn Bell's supervisors got Nobel Prize, but Jocelyn did not get. But that is the loss of Nobel Prize, not Jocelyn's, right? So uh, also like normal stars or other emissions, they are in throughout electromagnetic spectrum. This pulsar emission is also throughout the electromagnetic spectrum from radio to optical to X-ray to gamma ray. But, but for the same reason, you can make your radio telescope on the earth. You can make them as big as possible. You can observe pulsars in radio wavelength very precisely. So from this point of my talk, I, so I by pulsar, I will mean only studying pulsar in the radio wavelength. Here are few interesting radio telescopes. So th those are basically like our dish antenna, but very, very big. But the, uh, these two are in the US, and this is our SIBO, it collapsed uh, two years ago. This is an amazing facility we have near Pune, GMRT, Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. This is also another uh, very interesting uh, radio telescope. It is at the top of Uti Mountain. So I, we are using this GMRT very much, but we used to use Uti also. That also gave quite good results. So as I said, the first radio pulsar was discovered in 1967. Today, we know more than 3,300 pulsars. Most of the pulsars are isolated. There are a uh, few uh, three body systems. There are even four body systems. And actually first exoplanet was discovered around the pulsar. 
but that was not very famous because when people talk about exoplanet, people think about exoplanet which is orbiting a sun-like star where life can grow, but the first exoplanet discovery was by pulsar people. And there are about 350 binary pulsars, means you have a pulsar, a neutron star, and another star, it can be anything gravitationally bound to each other and orbiting around the common center of mass. And I like to study binary pulsars because they are the most useful to study gravitational physics. How? Let me tell you that. So first, what we see from pulsars? Yeah, obviously we see the radio signal, but with that, uh, uh, using those radio signals, what parameters we can measure? As we, uh, I just said that we see the signal once in ev every rotational period. So obviously by measuring the time difference between two consecutive signal, we measure the rotational period, what we call spin period. But that spin period is also not constant. It ch changes, means actually it increases. So we can measure that rate of change of spin period or spin period derivative. Why? Because the pulsar is emitting electromagnetic energy. And that energy is coming at the cost of rotational kinetic energy of the pulsar. So it is slowing down and it has a, a, a positive um, value of spin period derivative. And okay, then you also first two fundamental parameters you can measure for a pulsar is spin period and spin period derivative. Then from your basic theory of emission mechanism, we know these two interesting equations. This is the value of surface magnetic field, which is related to spin period and spin period derivative, means multiplication of that square root and this factor, yeah, it's, uh, this the, uh, Gauss, if spin period in second and this is second per second. So that is how we know that neutron star are very strong magnets because we cannot go to the neutron star and uh, measure their magnetic field. Also the age of neutron star are related to spin period and spin period uh, derivative. That is why this type of plots are very uh, popular. Here in the horizontal axis, I show spin period in second and the vertical axis is rate of change of spin period, means second per second, which is dimensionless. And all those points are different pulsars. You forget those different uh, style symbols, though are, those are actually classification of uh, pulsar, so we can ignore those. And those lines, you can see, yeah, this 10 to the power 10 Gauss means using this formula, we can draw that constant magnetic field lines and here constant edge lines. So those are very interesting uh, properties means spin period and spin period derivative are the most two fundamental parameters which we can measure. But this we can do for any pulsars means regardless of whether these pulsars are isolated or binary. But when you have, uh, so when you have a binary, uh, so that time you can measure uh, even more parameters. Because see, if you have a binary, say you are the people in Earth, the pulsar is once here, and if the orbit is like this, pulsar is once here. So the signal takes different time to reach you. So uh, that is why the spin period carries the information about its orbit. So by modeling this uh, spin period, we can measure the shape and size of the orbit, means orbital period, orbital eccentricity, uh, inclination of the orbit. And uh, then, as I said, you, you need general relativistic effort. So we can actually measure other parameters like change of the shape, ch change of the size. And because, uh, because we can measure those general relativistic effects and those parameters, we can use those pulsar to test various theories of various predictions uh, from general relativity. We can also measure masses of the pulsar and components because those equations of those general relativistic parameters, they contain masses. And then you can use those uh, pulsars to detect very low frequency gravitational waves, which are not yet done, which I will tell you a little bit. Uh, so, but before going to uh, that, I will just uh, let's briefly mention a few other interesting application of binary pulsars to study gravitational physics. So uh, we all know a few years ago, there was first detection of gravitational waves by LIGO group, but that was the first direct detection of gravitational waves. 
first detection of gravitational waves was done indirectly long ago by Hulse and Taylor uh, when the first binary pulsar was discovered. Means the pulsar which Jocelyn will discover that was on uh, isolated pulsar and first uh, binary pulsar was discovered in uh, 75. So then as, okay, if you have a binary pulsar means uh, two object orbiting, they emit gravitational waves and that gravitational waves carries energy and that energy comes at the cost of gravitational binding energy. So that binary pulsar it loses energy and the orbit shrinks and if the orbit shrinks orbital period decreases right. So the when the, the Hulse and Taylor are observing their pulsar and modeling they saw that the orbital period is decreasing and the only uh, reason for this decrease of orbital period can be the emission of gravitational wave from the system. And here you see the plot means those points are the data point uh, from this binary pulsar at uh, the rate of change of orbital period and that line this is the prediction uh, of general theory of relativity if that change was only due to gravitational wave uh, emission. So that uh, matches very good and that is why they got Nobel Prize in 93 and this time the PhD student Hulse also got the prize. Then there are many other interesting applications. I would just briefly mention two which I like. One can be done yes, if there is a pulsar with a black hole companion in a binary system, there will be very strong light bending effect means the black hole with curved space time around it and light will not travel in, in a straight path. So that can be observed and my PhD student Jyotijal is working on that and here is a uh, plot from his work. So if there was no light bending effect, if the pulsar signal was like that green curve and due to bending it, uh, you will get the pulse profile like something different. So that work is not yet finished, he is doing. There is another interesting work uh, study of gravitational physics came a few years ago. It was the very most precise test ever done uh, of strong equivalence principle. You know one uh, aspect of a strong equivalence principle is that the gravitational field experienced by an object depends only on its mass, not on the constituent of the particle. So here uh, there was a three body system, a pulsar and a white dwarf and there was another white dwarf outside it. And so that outer white dwarf's gravitational field on this inner white dwarf and pulsar was measured and it was found that it just depended on the masses of the pulsar and white dwarf. Means one is neutron um, uh, pulsar and another is white dwarf that did not matter at all. And that paper, we are not involved in this work, but when this paper came out, I was very amused to see that they used uh, my student Rube's code to eliminate the gravitational potential of the Milky Way gal galaxy. So that was actually a, a, a interesting study. But now I would, uh, last uh, five, six minutes, I will spend about what we are doing at present uh, and very excited about. Like I mentioned about LIGO and gravitational wave and obviously for uh, obvious reason we are all very excited few years ago when first detection was there, first direct detection was there. But we need to remember that was just the tip of the iceberg. What LIGO can ever detect only the high frequency gravitational waves and like the electromagnetic spectrum, gravitational wave is also very large spectrum. So there is high frequency gravitational waves which LIGO is detecting and after Indian LIGO joins they will detect more and more. Then there is low frequency gravitational waves for which we will need LISA, like space based interferometer. Then there is a very low frequency gravitational wave and uh, which we are trying to detect using pulsars and there is extremely low frequency gravitational waves which cosmologists are trying to detect. So what is this very low frequency gravitational wave? They are being emitted by uh, a supermassive black holes and mergers of supermassive black holes, mergers of various galaxies in all this re range and they are coming from outside our galaxy. And in our galaxy we have lots of pulsars and 
if there is gra those high low frequency gravitational wave the signal of the pulsars will carry the imprint of those gravitational wave so remember pulsars are emitting gravitational waves but the, those are high frequency ligo is detecting those but we are not trying to detect the uh, uh, gravitational waves emitted by pulsars we are using pulsars as our detector we are not making any detector nature has given us detector we are using a large number of pulsars to see whether we can see the imprint of very low frequency gravitational wave in their signal and for this purpose you need a large number of pulsar that is why this experiment is known as international pulsar timing array because you need an array of pulsars so there are currently four groups working on this first started australian pulsar timing array then north american gravitational wave observatory then came european pulsar timing array then we started our indian pulsar timing array in 2015 and uh, the first few years we were associate member and from 2021 when we proved that our data quality is as good as there we got full membership and here you see different countries and there be different telescope and we have our uh, gmrt which i already mentioned uh, and here are few boring uh, uh, information so this in indian uh, about our indian pulsar timing array effort it is a multi institutional effort so you can see imsc tifr ncra rri iit hyderabad iit roorkee bits filani hyderabad campus icer bhopal and recently japan's kuamamoto university also joined our team and, and uh, we have members of every level of uh, research career you can see the statistics there are some uh, the senior level faculty members post docs phd student even undergrad students in different iits you can find more information about uh, us in our website and i would, uh, you will see that uh, website is looks very professional and i would thank some undergrads in iit roorkee who uh, made this website for us and i would also like to say here thank imsc and uh, also other institutes because like uh, australians europeans or americans we don't have any dedicated funding for our this uh, experiment but all our institutes are kindly supporting us so uh, we are really thankful to our parent institutes and here we are at present uh, you can see our team uh, at various ages and here are few scientific details we are using upgraded gmrt you see the photo of gmrt which is located near pune run by ncra uh, so which has 30 antenna it's uh, 45 meter diameter and it has a very wide frequency coverage 300 megahertz to 1500 megahertz and that make us very unique because in this frequency range you can divide it into uh, various bands and you can each band of 200 megahertz width and you can do simultaneous uh, multi band observation and that is very unique because that makes us enables us to measure dispersion measure very accurately dispersion measure is actually a kind of quantification of propagation delay of radio waves through interstellar medium and we need to know it very well to model the pulse uh, when the pulse is arriving because that is what we are going to use to detect gravitational wave and th uh, that made us unique so uh, what is uh, what we have done uh, since 2015 so because of this uniqueness multiband observation uh, which is possible using gmrt only uh, so only we can do uh, highest precision dm measurements uh, ever uh, done in pulsar astronomy we could do we made our data public recently and our data quality is all, uh, as good as uh, international effort uh, which started in 2014 and that is also possible only because gmrt is so uh, precise so i will skip this to plots those are just to show our data how good is our data 
So we are still continuing our uh, observation and more data is being pulled, uh, means, uh, we are observing and analyzing data, more and more data is being added and all other PTAs are also doing that. And the nature of this experiment is that the more data you add, the quality will uh, become better. So we are hoping all our effort hopefully will detect gravitational waves that very low frequency gravitational wave very soon maybe in 2025 or so. So I will stop here today and this is what just before pandemic we organized international meeting in Pune this you see our NPTA team among the international people. So let me stop here.